imagine you have a, that little window which you see there. Imagine that traveling across um, a plane full of blood cells. Then you obviously count all of those which are inside the, the track, but you also count some of them which are either wholly in it or only poking a little bit, little bit into it, depending on how sensitive the system is. So you get an error, and you don't actually know what that error is. So I said here, well, if you do that, you get the right number, those which are properly within this, and you get an error which is due to the two edges, the two, the two, the a. So the, the, the answer you get here is x plus 2a. Now, if you do this again with a, with a slit which is exactly twice as wide, now you have 2x, the right number, plus the, sa the same number of edges, 2a, if you subtract one from the other, um, 2x plus 2a minus x plus 2a, you get the right number. I mean, not difficult to understand, is it? This was a magic number, and there I was at the age of 19 or whatever I was by, the, I, by this time, getting my first publication into nature. Um, uh, of um, this being um, uh, uh, the first pack, it's not, it's not, not used now, there are Kuta counters and so on which are much cleverer than this, but this was the first practical way of counting small objects of one kind or another. This gave rise to further employment with me because I, I, I hadn't been to university, I mean I'd, I'd, I'd given up my place at, at Oxford because I got so involved with this and in a sense taught myself electronics and engineering Sort of the sort of things which we which had to do. Very good, to, I mean, I mean, an autodidact, which is a, of actually learning by doing, is a really a very efficient way of, of, getting, of, get, of, of um, getting, some, getting some experience. And I saw a job being advertised um, uh, in Wales, uh, where the government had committed itself at the end of the war to do something about dust and coal mines, because there was a disease called pneumoconiosis, which coal miners very frequently suffered from. And uh, there was ex actually no really very good way of estimating the dust concentration, which wasn't extremely labor intensive. So there was a job, and I said, well, look, I know all about counting little things, but why don't you give the job to me? Um, so I, I, I actually got the job. Again, no qualification of any kind other than a uh, higher school certificate, and did indeed devise a machine, which wasn't to, to do with counting at all. It was, in fact, it, it used a, a mechanism, which I haven't illustrated here, which is much the same mechanism as the lung uses um, of sorting particles. Some of the big ones sediment quite quickly and, and fall out in your mouth and your throat and so on. You don't breathe them into your lung. The very, very tiny ones behave like a gas and you breathe them out again. And it was only a range of particles. And I, I made a machine which used really the sedimentation velocity of the particles to sort out those which, which would um, be retained by the lung and which weren't. But what's much more important was there was an exceedingly pretty staff nurse in the, um, <laughs> in, in, in the, the ward which was attached to the, to the medical research council unit um, called Staff Nurse Stevenson, who in due course became my wife. Um, and so there's a direct connection between, um, and who incidentally, I've now been married for 56 years, who, who still, who still isn't, isn't my wife. Well, I finished, you know, I finished university, um, um, I had to choose what I was going to do at university, and I said, well, I've done engineering in a sort of, sort of way, even myself. Perhaps I ought to do something biological. And so I, I read physiology at University College in London and became a physiologist. Um, but uh, I was paid for by the Medical Research Council, and the only condition I had to, for was I didn't have to promise to go back, come back and work for them or anything like that. But what it did say, that every long vacation, or any other vacation for that matter, I would have to work in a different medical research council unit so as to get more experience about what kind of things the medical research council had to offer. And in my first, my first um, long vacation, I worked at King's College just in the year, by sheer good fortune, when the double helix business was being fought out. You know, there was a Cambridge team with Watson, Crick, and there was a London team with Randall and Pepe. Well, I was working in, just at that summer, it all happened, at the, at the, university, at the King's College team, uh, with Rosalind, with, um, uh, Rosalind Franklin, who some of you may have seen her, her biography, which is relatively recently. And so I got to know all the, the players in the, in, the double, in the double helix team as I as went back to University College. And in my second uh, long vacation, there are only three after all, there are only two of them in a three-year course, I was at the tail end of Field Marshal Slim of Burma fame, uh, going to Sandhurst, 
and probably without thinking at all about it, said, hmm, the coots look a bit peaky, don't they? And the, the war office went into a complete panic because there was national service, and if, it were, if they were literally underfeeding um, a whole generation of young men, this could have very serious consequences. So the medical research counter was given the job of uh, measuring the energy balance of the national service recruit, of which there were tens and tens of thousands. Um, so there was, so it was a question of measuring how much energy they were actually expecting to, be, to produce and how much energy in terms of food uh, the army was putting into them. And there wasn't actually any bit of machinery for measuring how much energy they were actually producing. So they told me this in my application, and I spent most of the last year at college um, actually devising a machine for doing this. And here you see it. It was called the IMP. And what it did was that it, it measured the amount of air which the soldier expired, and it also took a, a statistical sample of it. There was a little pump inside the machine which, say, took one twenty ten thousandths of the volume. So it was, it was modulated by how much air was passing through. So if there was a lot of air passing through, then we could take a bigger sample. Then, and it accumulated all this in a, in, a, in a neoprene bag, which isn't very permeable to carbon dioxide and, 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 and oxygen. And um, many, many hundreds of soldiers all over the country did all their first 10 weeks training Wearing one, of these, wearing one of these machines, even, 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 even um, sleeping with them. And um, the, the uh, end was that the home service ration was actually increased. They were actually going to get some more. It, it wasn't actually necessary because um, however much food the army gave them, they all went to the naffy and ate egg and chips in the evening. <laughs> um, because the whole point of the 10 weeks of primary training was to knock all personality out of the people who had been mother's darling and so on. So they needed some outlet where they could still exercise free will. And the only time they could exercise free will was in the nappy in the evening. So as I say, they ate egg and chips, whatever, whatever other food um, you gave them. Anyway, this was, this was the biggest physiological experiment ever done because of, of such relatively, la relatively large numbers of people. And um, um, here's a machine, that, that's a flow meter up there. Those of you are interested in how these things work, it's really a bit like a rotameter, if you, some of you will know what a rotameter is. The air went, in, went, went into there, it increased the pressure inside this chamber here, it extended these springs very slightly so that the force increase was very small and opened up a gap through which the air could get out um, so that the, the height by which that plate you see there was lifted was proportional to the airflow passing through the device. And this was... was um, turned into, into an electrical quantity. Remember, so this has only just about been invented at that time. The electrical quantity by moving the slider on a tiny potentiometer, so a voltage came out of this thing, which was proportional to the flow of air. And in the end, you got a thing like a gas meter here, which, which, which told you how much, how much um, air had passed through the device. And there was a big tin, which isn't shown on here, which had the rubber bag inside it, which includes the sample. So once you knew how much air they had expired and how much oxygen was missing from it, and also how much carbon dioxide was in it, because there's a, there's a small correction required. We then knew how much food they'd burnt. And we had another team who measured um, uh, what they left on their plates and so on, who, who actually measured how much food they had. So we, we, we were able to set up a balance sheet. And this was, this was a, so this, I say, one of the weirder things, possibly due to an, an ill-considered remark. I don't believe that Field Marshall 